So a little uh, background on me. Uh, I'm one of the co-founders and chief customer officer at Cloudability. Um, we are based in Portland, Oregon. Has everybody seen Portlandia, the documentary? The documentary? Yeah. It's, um, <laughs> so we're based in Portland, Oregon. Um, I've uh, been with the company for five years. It's the age of the company is the same age as my, my twin boys, almost to the week. Um, and today I want to talk a little bit about our life cycle of going from really passive management of customers to a much more active approach to uh, focusing on the life, the life cycle with those customers. Um, so a little background on our product while he's pulling those up. Uh, we are a, a high-touch success model. So we have a, a very complex space, which is cloud cost management, uh, lots of complex data and domain knowledge there. Uh, we have complex customer needs, so customers who sometimes have hundreds of users of our product from ops to finance to engineering. Um, and we also have a complex product on the back of that because complex needs, complex data equals an analytics product uh, that lets customers do a lot of different things in a lot of different ways. So the talk I'm going to be focusing on is really through the lens of a platform that is not quick on, you know, you do a 10 minute training, uh, it's not about one or two users, it's basically onboarding a complex set of users, uh, sometimes hundreds of them, uh, with lots of integrations of data uh, and lots of different levels of training and onboarding. So I want to make that distinction because I've seen some of the other talks are more focused on, here we go, this is looking good. Some of the other talks are more focused on uh, less technical products, ours definitely falls into the higher touch smaller number of large customers. Initially, you know, we were a lot of, like a lot of companies, we signed up our first customers, we were really excited about it, it was lots of high fives, and then we realized we had to do something to support them. So first, you know, we set up a support at Cloudability alias, uh, and I was answering that initially. I was just, you know, a question would come in, I would reply, and that was fine, uh, until the volume really started to pick up a bit, and then we hired a support person. And then it was fine again for a while. And it continued like that for the first year or so, uh, that we were signing customers until we got to the next stage, which was, we have a whole bunch more customers, and that was exciting and uh, challenging, and it broke our old model, because at this point, our product started to move from a simpler product in its infancy to a much more complex product with more use cases, more users, et cetera. And so at this is the point where we started thinking about proactive outreach, and we split uh, the people working with customers into the reactive group, the support group, and the proactive group, which at that time, they weren't called this, but they ultimately became our technical account managers. And we hired one person into this role um, as a technical account manager. Uh, his name's Mike, a uh, great guy, loves prints. And he, uh, his first year was really, really rough because we didn't really give him any guidance. We basically said, here's a hundred and some customers that we want you to take care of. Uh, reach out to them, help them, get, make them stickier. And he basically spent his first year sending hundreds and hundreds of emails. He got really good at Yesware and Gmail, uh, sending help. He'd look at their account, he'd kind of figure out if they could you know, use the best practice here or help them with the support and reach out. And sometimes they would reply and sometimes they wouldn't. Um, but customers seemed to like it. They were you know, responding positively when they did reply. And we continued like that for a while until we got to a point where we had some churn. And it was really kind of surprising. In hindsight, it wasn't. But at the time, it was like, hey, we've, we've been talking to these people. They like us. It was like high fives again. We like you guys. But we weren't really focusing on the time at anything really, I think, not that it wasn't meaningful. We weren't focused on the bigger picture goals for them. We were focused on little outreaches uh, that were, although they were prolific, they weren't focused at all. So we decided we needed to do something a little bit different. Uh, and this is kind of where we were when we undertook this approach. Um, we had a lot of customers who were growing, growing organically on the platform. That was great. It was a big opportunity. But the challenge on the back side of that is, and when I say growing organically, meaning they were spending more with us, they were getting broader adoption, broader usage. The challenge we ran into, though, was that their spending was scaling, and they wanted to see more value. They went from you know, spending X, and they sometimes went 10X that, uh, and were at that point really just getting that very uh, infrequent and unfocused reach out from us. So the other thing that was happening then was that our renewals were auto-renewals, which was great. And you know, in the scheme of things, if people were happy, it would auto-renew and that would be fine. But if somebody didn't know it was coming, or they were unhappy, or they forgot to set their calendar reminder, and then they auto-renewed, that was a big friction point. People didn't like that very much. Uh, as I mentioned also, we increasingly had a complex product, complex customer needs, and uh, complex data. For our customers, some of the data we ingest, uh, one of the data formats is a, for some of our largest, is a 300 million row CSV file that's updated every day. 600 gig CSV file. So there's a lot of domain knowledge in there that our product 
sheds light on, but ultimately you need a really highly skilled and tuned uh, data person to understand that. Uh, and finally, fast forwarding a little bit, um, the team was growing. So uh, we very quickly went from basically two, me and another guy in success, uh, up to eight. Uh, the sales team also grew really quickly. And we realized we needed a little more structure put into place. So the goal was kind of obvious. It's the top of most people's lists when they talk about success. It was to increase renewals. Um, I wanted to highlight this because, as we've heard, I think the last gentleman, or the last lady mentioned as well, you know, focusing on the customer values and goals is really important. And this was our goal kicking off. Um, and we realized that we needed to work that into a larger process. Um, and the renewals really mattered. And this may seem really basic, and everybody can, has probably heard this a lot, but I wanted to highlight why the renewals are such a big deal for a lot of our companies. Uh, we're subscription-based businesses. Now, there's one piece of that, which is you get revenue every month. That's great. You know, you want a uh, dollar of contracted annual or monthly renewing revenue uh, over, you know, ten dollars of one-time revenue. But the really interesting thing about uh, most SaaS companies is that uh, ultimately the bill for your SaaS service is ultimately going up almost in all cases because footprints expand. You upsell, they use more, they take more licenses. For a lot of companies like ours, this stuff kind of happened organically. We charge a percentage of cloud spending, cloud spending would go up, the bill would go up. That was great, but we had to show scaling value with that along the way. And on top of that, a lot of companies that we talk about segmenting, a lot of people and saying, you know, treat your big customers this way, your smaller customers another way. When you have this model where spending is going up, sometimes your small customers turn into really big customers and you don't get the chance to do that early onboarding that you want. You don't get the time to spend with them. Maybe you haven't done QBRs. Maybe you haven't actually uh, spent one-on-one -on -one time with them. So for us, this was a, a really great realization in terms of the overall business model, but presented a big challenge for the success team in particular. So we put together what we called CURML, because I like acronyms, the Customer Relationship Management Lifecycle. And Essentially, what Kermel was all about was this. We wanted to move from passively hoping the renewals would happen, which is kind of what we were doing. We'd sign somebody up, and they would renew or they wouldn't, to actively managing them. So as part of this process, our TAMs were initially sending tons of outreach. They were constantly emailing customers. They were trying to keep their relationships going. It was very, uh, you know, will you talk to me? No. Okay, how about you? Will you talk to me? How about this one? And so we wanted to make it much clearer about who did what. Uh, and in our model, we had a peered model. We ended up with sales and success uh, and peers. So we wanted to move it so that the TAMs uh, ultimately were spending less time doing that type of outreach and had more time to really do deep dives with customers to make them sticky. So we ended up with a split like this. Um, we had sales reps acting as quarterbacks and technical account managers acting as running backs. I don't do sports at all. I had to Google this. This is what came up. <laughs> Uh, I hope that's right for anybody who uh, is into sports. Um, so in this world, we made it very clear, which is that the sales reps own the relationship, and they make sure there's somebody on the other end of the line. When we pick up the phone to call, does somebody answer and want to play ball with us? Uh, we also made it such that, so that they ensure all the key meetings happen. We found that the technical account manager types we were hiring, as they became increasingly more technical, were not well geared to the idea of calling 100 times or emailing 15 times or doing that type of outreach that sales is much better at. On the other side, with the TAMs, we wanted them to really focus deeply on getting in the weeds, so doing the kickoffs and QBRs, uh, doing these deep trainings on all these areas we're talking about, and ultimately focusing on adoption in the organization. Now, I will note, uh, as I've had a few conversations about this today, uh, our model's kind of simple in the sense that uh, our TAMs don't have renewal under them. They don't have, really have an upsell. All that falls under the reps. Part of that is because, as I mentioned, our platform sort of grows organically for a lot of users. We have a lot of companies start small and get bigger. So our focus is really on just retaining, first and foremost, less upselling necessarily. And what we ended up putting into place was a very prescriptive um, key milestones process. And this is a, a simplified version, but it basically went like this. Uh, at day zero, we did a discovery and kickoff meeting. And I highlighted goals here. I'm going to highlight it a few more times in the future bullets because originally we would kick off a customer and we would get on the phone with them and we would be like, so let's open up the app. What do you want to do? Let's build you some reports. Let's get in there and kind of poke at things until hopefully we get what you want. And we realized we really needed to reset that so that our focus was not on necessarily getting them to value on the first call, which was great and fun, but it didn't really have long-lasting effects, more figuring out how are they going to be successful over the next three, six, nine, 12 months. 
So this call became all about getting out of the application, getting out of the tech, and really just backing up to say, forget whatever we talked about in the sales process, because what's said in the sales process is sometimes different than what the reality is later. What do you, what do you want to do? Like, what does success look like for you in three months, in six months, in a year? And being very prescriptive about that, having a deck that we open up on the screen and actually type this in, in front of the customer while they're reading this, while we're screen sharing, so there's an agreement among us about where we need to get. So there's no questions about where to go next. And that really opened us up into a much better onboarding program because suddenly the entire onboarding plan was focused on those goals. What do we need to get you to that goal? I was listening to a talk downstairs um, by Omer from Tatango, and he was saying how there's four primary use cases for Tatango, and they map customers against those use cases, and then they figure out how to get them to value there. Similar for us, we have five primary use cases that we have, we call them our five stages. If we know very clearly what somebody's going after, it's gonna to totally change our onboarding plan. And that shift of thinking around the goals initially was very important to get there. And then we got into a fairly typical, you would say, QBR process. Um, except we realized each of the QBRs was very different than what we needed to be doing. So at the three-month QBR, this was about did we get there? Did the setup really get done? And also, did you get to any level of value? Now, notably, often you get to that three-month QBR and you can look at the goals and you can see where they were, and it's often not uh, a fault of the platform that they didn't get value. It's, you know, other things came up in the business. They got distracted, there weren't resources committed. And this is a great milestone. We'd say, okay, well, here were the goals again. We're gonna put these in front of you. We're gonna revisit those and talk through, did we get there? So goal progress. At uh, the six-month six point, six point um, we came back to the goals again. Seems pedantic, but at the end of the day, we realized that whenever we got on a call with somebody and we weren't being prescriptive about what we were there, what we were trying to accomplish, and look at the bigger picture, it's very easy to get off to the left, to the right, to just jump into the application for little questions to come up. So constantly using this as a milestone, a, a sort of a, a mile marker to come back to. Um, and at the six-month point, we realized that was the point at which, uh, for us anyway, it was the right time to start talking about roadmap. Before that, it was sort of distracting because in those first three months, onboarding, getting set up, getting ready to go, the next six, really you're off to the races, you should be getting value. That's the point at which we wanna start having the conversation with you. You've used the platform, you understand what it can and can't do. Now, in six months, you're gonna be renewing. What do you need in order for that renewal to be successful? And let's look at our roadmap and let's see if there's anything that is on there that's coming that you want to accelerate. Um, or is there anything that you wanna talk about that we don't yet have on there? And then, just to stay completely pedantic with this, we went back to goals again at nine months. Um, but this one was all about the ROI. So we talked about the goals, we've agreed them, we've come back to them multiple times. But let's literally show how we did against those and show what savings you had on the back of that. Now in our world, it's all about uh, cost management, cost tracking, tracking how much you spent on cloud, how much you saved. We have some very clear uh, ROI metrics for that. Uh, what did your bill do? How much were you able to save, et cetera? But the idea here was that we did not want to go into the renewal with people unprepared. We didn't want to sell them and then 12 months later talk to them again. We didn't want to um, have them forget it was renewing. At each of these stages, we're being very prescriptive about the life cycle and say, here's where you are, here's what's coming. So that ultimately, you got to that renewal, God willing, it happened, and then you reset the whole process. So within this, there were a lot of different uh, smaller checkpoints and details and trainings and whatnot. Um, but all of this, we ended up uh, making sort of a, a locked process for uh, all the customers over a certain size, and then uh, are in the process now of automating this for the smaller customers. And when a customer signed, each of these things would be kicked off as a task. Um, in Salesforce, the task to schedule these events. And ultimately, uh, on the backbone of this, once those meetings happened, uh, we got to the notes. And this is a really, I think, unsexy and not exciting thing to talk about at a customer success conference, but the notes we found were really the thing that made or break, made or break, <laughs> can't talk today made or did not make the whole system. Uh, so we found that with a team that was more than one or more than two, everybody did notes differently. And nobody really wanted to write down the notes because you have another thing to get to, you have another call to get to, et cetera. But the notes were super key because ultimately we needed some basic things, right? Who was there, what were the wins, what were the action items? But in order to see across the customer lifecycle how this kernel process worked, we had to be able to go back at each step in the process to see what did they say? How far along against the goals were we? Did we hit them or not? Uh, this is, has been probably the hardest thing about the whole process, which is kind of constantly drilling in what needs to be covered in these, how much time to spend on them, and how to record them. 
But ultimately, each of these things went into um, uh, events that we could track over time with different categories and report back on the progress against all of them. So in terms of supporting processes, um, we had a few things that we also put into place at the same time. So first and foremost, um, trying to get a combined view of the customer. I mean, this is kind of what this conference and I think Tatango is all about, which is pulling together all the pieces. Uh, we have a lot of systems, as you guys probably do. We have all these things, Pardot, Intercom, we've got Zendesk, we've got Salesforce. Um, we need to get them all in one place because when we were just sort of you know, looking to see what could we do for the customer today, it was fine to get in all those systems, but getting into a single view became really key to knowing where to go next with the customer. The onboarding also uh, became a really important thing. And the two things I'd stress here, because I, I know there's been a lot of talks about onboarding today, uh, was that we focused on reducing time to value. So how do we get you as quickly as possible to hitting one of those goals? And then secondly, which is the hardest, was getting all users the same experience. So when we onboard our power users, we spend a lot of time with them. It's high touch. But six months down the road, they may add another 200 users. And originally, they were just sort of left out there. They get a login, they show up. So as much as possible, what we've been focusing on this realm is how do we give everybody the same experience, but also apply that same level of intensity to onboarding that we would to closing a deal. Much like we were talking about, or she was talking about the last talk, you know, how do you measure those implementation cycles and actually report on them? The next thing we did was uh, looked for the third time. This is our V3 of health scoring. Uh, it turned out that after a few rounds of this, there was no correlation to a green customer and success, or a red customer in turn. Um, the initial version was very much just sentiment-based. It was, how does the, the TAM feel or the rep feel? Uh, we then went into some very kind of basic usage metrics, you know, logins, um, you know, number of reports created. But ultimately, we sort of had to reverse engineer all of our last, I'd say, probably took five or 10 major churns, like the big you know, ones that we, we wanted to look the most at, and figure out what did they not have that the successful customers had. And really get into the weeds, which ultimately this system became the backbone for our onboarding plan, because we wanted to back people into success. Um, so we ended up with a red, yellow, green, kind of common uh, type of system with this. Um, and the TAMs use this to get basically to uh, what their next goals were. And as Kermit says, it is not easy being green. It was really painful to get uh, one, a customer that we've had for a couple years and actually look through, you know, do we have this type of user? Do we have this type of user? Do we um, you know, have this number of people logging in every day? All these criteria and go, wow, our customer base is not quite where we thought it was. So I definitely recommend everyone you know, to take a look if they haven't already at their scoring again to say, you know, how can I make this harder? How can I make it much, much more difficult to get into green? Uh, next thing that we're very much in the process of adding now is that always on training. So we had the, each user show up over time. They didn't get onboarded. They needed something. So we started with uh, bi-weekly power user trainings, uh, went to recorded content, uh, working on certification programs. Uh, this to me is, I think, one of the, it's like one of those important but not urgent things in success. We have been trying to get to this in a way I want to get to it for years uh, and are just now, I think, really starting to lean into it. Uh, without this, you can't scale your success team. Without having all the things that your customer would talk to your uh, rep about, you end up stuck. And that's kind of where we ended up. And so we started to implement a little more of this. Uh, recent addition also, asynchronous escalations. Um, we did away with account reviews. No more do we sit down once a week or once a month to look through all the accounts. We made it totally asynchronous, which meant that the TAMs and reps each week, as there's a change, basically uh, rescore their customers. And when that happens, the revenue leadership, the sales and success leadership, basically get notified of this straight away. Uh, and what that means is uh, we can increase the speed to meet remediation. Sometimes there was a one or two week gap between something happening and an account review and us actually making a change with the customer. Now, of course, if it's a giant account that doesn't happen, but when you're talking about a weekly account review and you're going down your list of customers, you're going to start at the big ones. You don't always get to the smaller ones. So this process became really helpful for us also to give visibility to the rest of the company about the true health of the customers. Uh, and ultimately, it worked well. I mean, it took a couple quarters to get into place. The first quarter, we saw a big drop in churn uh, pretty much right away, which was very exciting. Our customers were uh, surprised we weren't doing it before. The downside was that there were some accounts that churned sooner than I think they would have otherwise because they weren't really being used. We weren't talking to them. They weren't talking to us. We started poking them. They left. That was a little hard to stomach. Um, definitely had some long conversations about that uh, with the rest of the exec team. But ultimately, we realized those are people that would have left eventually anyway. And we could then focus our time not on trying to get a hold of them, but on the customers who really were there for the right reasons. So takeaways, uh, QBRs, onboarding, 
all about goals. Um, what do you really want to get to? Three months, six months, nine months? That's kind of the only conversation that we have in that kickoff. So we set up the rest of the process. The TAMs ended up loving it because it gave them a roadmap. Salespeople made renewals more easier. I'm running out of time here. Last thing I want to say is uh, we found that success resources ended up bottomless. We kept hiring people, and immediately we would have not enough resources. Uh, if you have smart, talented people doing success, your customers are going to want to talk to them. This is where a system like this, with any other type you want, becomes really important because otherwise your people will run out of time. They will run out of things, emails they can send at the end of the day, and um, without guardrails, it'll sort of get away. And I'll throw out the blatant pitch. If anybody knows anybody, we're hiring technical account managers in both Portland and San Francisco. Here's the requirements. Questions? Thank you. All right.